must come from the house, right? House only. Uh, typically, bills that involve some sort of the public have to come from the house, not come from the Senate, kind of vice versa. Uh, and any, any other issue may come from any other branch, so we can get any other issue that is voted upon uh, comes from either the house or the Senate. It really doesn't matter too much. So types of bills, there's a few different types of bills. Uh, one is the public bills, so that affects everyone in the nation, right? So like our taxes, uh, or um, stuff like that. Everything that affects everybody is a public bill. Right? And then we got private bills. Private bills are measures that apply to certain persons or places, usually not the, or not the nation as a whole, right? So we kind of talked about that yesterday, right? The, uh, the differences between the public and private bills. How bills get their names. All right. Bills that are introduced are marked by two things. All right. It's either going to start with an HR or an S. All right. The HR is for the House of Representatives and the S is for the Senate. And after each bill, they end with a number. Example, like 810 would be the 810th measure introduced during the congressional term. All right. So bills don't have their own special made up number, they're usually made in order of what number that bill is introduced into the House or the Senate. Right. And then after the letter and number, a clerk provides a brief description of the contents of the bill. Example, HR 5260 was the Reduced Cost and Continued Cares Act. Right. Does that kind of make sense? Now we have riders. Riders are a uh, provision not likely to pass on its own, like their own bill. And they must be attached to another bill in order to get uh, passed, hence the word rider. All right. They're often attached to bills so that the parent bill does not pass and gets vetoed by the president. Uh, <coughs> bills must be accepted in their entirety. The president cannot pick and choose which parts of the bill to sign off on or not. All right. Writers are very, very controversial. There's many different types of controversial writers that have been attached to bills. For example, what we know is the end of the net neutrality, right? That happened back in 2016. That was super, super big. All right. That was attached to a bill related to military and veteran construction projects. All right. It had nothing to do with that actual bill, but that writer was attached. So that way, uh, the project, right, the bill itself can actually get passed. Okay. And then also you got the Real ID Bill, which was attached to the Emergency Supplemental Appropriations Act for Defense and the Global War on Terror and Tsunami Relief. All right, Real ID, right? We all have those these days, or we should be getting them. We have, I think, until 2025 to get them. So that's basically going to be our new like passport kind of, of how you know for us to be able to fly on that. Yeah. So who adds the writer? So the writers, uh, they can come from basically everywhere. A lot of the writers are uh, like special interest stuff, right? People who run for the House and the Senate, you know, they make promises to us, like we're going to get this passed for you guys. And a lot of these writers, uh, they know that they won't pass on their own, right? So they'll attach these to the writer or to these other bills. So it can come from basically everywhere. Uh, as I said, they're basically not something that uh, is related to Bill at all. Alright, writers are very sketchy. Um, they're often called a bully, like it's used to basically bully a president, right? So you get an opposing house and will attach some writers to a certain bill. Uh, and that way the president is like, well, I need to pass this, right? It's good for the nation, it's good for my you know, campaign, it's good for my image. But, uh, we have some of these writers in here, and usually the president has to decide if that writer is worth actually passing that bill. Okay. Now we got Christmas tree bills. 
All right, Christmas trees are often multiple rider bills, right? So it's multiple, multiple different riders attached to that bill. Okay. Christmas tree bills are, uh, grow as minor bills passed in the House. Uh, senators can also add unrelated amendments to the bill, right? So those are riders itself as well. Those amendments often give tax benefits to special interest groups in the senators' home states and campaign con uh, contributors, right? So this is how they kind of do their little sketchy stuff, right? That's how, the, you know, one of the reasons why Congress and stuff like that isn't often trusted by our public, because they throw in these kind of weird little uh, special interest bills and stuff like that. Now, it got its name from Clinton Anderson, is a Democratic senator from New Mexico. All right. He served from 1943 to 1973 uh, after a farm bill had more than 100 writers attached to it. Okay, So bills don't have to have a certain amount of amendments or amount of writers. Right? So they can tax on about however many it takes, basically. Right? So uh, he was quoted in the magazine asking about it. They're like, what do you think about this? Why was there 100 different things? And he's like, well, it's like a Christmas tree, right? There's Everything under it, uh, or basically everybody, right? So all those writers have different uh, things that benefit different people. Now, bills go to committees, all right? So if the chairman of the committee refers it to a subcommittee for review, there are multiple different types of subcommittees, whether it's in the House or the Senate, all right? These committees are the ones that sift through bills and often reject um, most of them before they're even voted upon. Okay. This is what they call pigeonhole. Okay, so some bills don't even pass through uh, the House or the Senate. All right, a lot of bills die within the House and the Senate themselves before they're even voted upon or brought to the president's desk. Uh, most bills that come from other outside interest groups are often affected by the pigeonholes. Right, so that's why they we get like writer bills. Okay, they won't pass on their own, so they'll attach them to other stuff. Does that make sense? So discharge petition, uh, what a discharge uh, petition does, it enables members to force a bill that remained in a committee for 30 days to move on. Okay, so they have this special little 30 period or 30 day period where they either got to pass it through or they got to uh, reject it. All right, and then after the 30 days, they'll force the bill to move on. So it goes on to its next step. All right, if the motion is signed by a majority, the bill must report to the floor by the committee. If the motion passes, uh, the House must consider the bill immediately. They can't sit on it for another time period. It must happen right then and there. Uh, when it happens, it's often historic, like the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2022, which changed the uh, federal campaign finance law, how much uh, senators and people you know, uh, running for positions in office, how much they can actually take in, and uh, set limits on that, basically. So, subcommittees, right? So, bills that reach a committee almost always refers it to a subcommittee, right? So there's committees and there's subcommittees and there's subcommittees. All right, these subcommittees are built for more controversial bills, all right? Uh, they can call witnesses to testify and produce evidence for a bill. A lot of your House representatives and a lot of your senators are part of multiple different types of subcommittees, right? And that's what uh, they kind of do to be able to, I don't know how to say it, basically make sure that the bill that they are uh, doing is right, right towards their campaign and stuff like that, towards their promises, basically. Now, committee actions. Once a sub subcommittee completes its work, the measure goes to a full committee. All right, now the full committee at the chair's, uh, chair's direction can do a lot of stuff, all right? They can make it a due pass where the chair must steer the bill through the debate floor. All right, they can either refuse to report it, aka pigeonhole it, right? So it dies, basically. Or they can send it back to change or amend the bill, right? Some bills get sent back because of their contents or uh, a writer that was attached to it. Uh, they also can do not recommend that the bill, uh, they do not recommend the bill, meaning that uh, makes the House and the uh, House itself kills the bill. 
or they report it to a committee bill who rewrites the measure as a substitute for the bills referred. So when it comes to scheduling bills for debate, bills that pass committees are placed on the calendar. All right, These, there are five different calendars which each have their own purpose. All right, so we got the union calendar, which refers to those having to do with revenues, appropriations, or government property. We also have our house calendar, which is for all bills that are public bills. And we have private calendars, which is for basically all the other private bills. Right? We have our corrections calendar. When bills are minor, it will pass with no opposition. Right? And then we have our discharge calendar for bills uh, in which have been petitioned to be discharged. So the bills have finally reached the floor. Now what? Well. Uh, Sort of. It still has committees to go through with the committee of a whole. All right. The committee of a whole is meant to expedite the process in forms of quorum in which only the majority of the House has to be present. All right. Uh, when House and the Senate is in session, not everybody has to be there um, for it to go through. All right. The Speaker is not a part of this process since it's a separate part of the House of Representatives itself. Right. And then we are talking about yesterday about filibustering. Um, filibustering doesn't often happen in the House of Representatives, and here's what it is. It's basically they only have five minutes uh, for those who support it or against it. They can't filibuster like they can in the Senate. All right. So they only have five minutes for that. So, time to debate. A rule in 1942, or 1842, forbids any member firm holding the floor for more than one hour without unanimous unanimous consent to speak uh, longer. The speaker has the power to keep those on topic and they must give up the floor. Now voting. Voting takes time. Uh, a lot of bills are often vetoed, amended, tabled, or struck down. Uh, this is what happens when they do voting. Um, votes are counted by A's and or I's and O's, right? So they'll have uh, whoever it is I forget the actual name of it, of the person, the clerk, right? Uh, it's it's a voice vote, right? So whatever the majority of the voices go, that's the eyes and the nose. They also do a standing in favor or against and count each individual each individual member. Uh, they also do the teller vote for non-electronic, and that's typically what we see today. Uh, it's a lot easier. It goes by a lot faster. Now, once the uh, bill is approved, it goes to the Senate. Now, the Senate is much less strict in their committees. Uh, they only have one calendar for all their bills, so everything kind of goes through at the same time. Uh, now, as opposed to the House, right, this is where we get the unrestrained debate. Uh, this is where filibustering comes in. Okay, Filibustering is when but de they delay the bill, old, I should say, so that the Senate either drops the bill or changes it to the liking of others. Right. You know, filibustering can happen uh, really at any time, and there's no topic on which uh, they may speak about when it comes to filibustering. Right? So they can sit up there, they can read books, they can talk about sports, they can talk about absolutely everything or anything. Right? Now, the most famous one is Senator uh, Storm Thurmond, a uh, Republican from South Carolina, who held the floor for 24 hours and 18 minutes against the Civil Rights Act of 1957. All right. So, filibustering can happen a long time. Uh, typically, what either happens is people either get tired of listening to them talk and we're like, all right, fine, we'll do something about it. Or they just stand their ground like they did here and uh, they'll get that bill and act pass. After he finished, they, five minutes later, they voted it in. He just wasted 24 hours. That's all he did. Yeah. So, now the president, right? The president has four options when a bill gets presented to him. Right? They may sign it and the bill becomes law. They may veto it uh, or the president refuses to sign it causing the bill to be returned back to the House in which it originated, whether it was originating in the Senate or in the House of Representatives itself. Uh, if the bill is vetoed, Congress can actually pass that bill with a two-thirds vote. All right. 
The bill may become law when the president does not sign it for 10 days of receiving it, all right? not including Sundays. All right? So if a bill is introduced today, they have 10 days not including Sunday to be able to sign that bill if the president does all right. If Congress adjourns its session within 10 days of submitting a bill and the president does not act, the measure dies. All right. So, if the House and the Senate are trying to pass a bill and they end their session, if it does not happen within uh, 10 days, the measure dies. All right. Now, there's resolutions. All right. There's different types of uh, ways that we can get bills into laws. All right, so we have a joint resolution. Joint resolutions are like uh, bills in which they become laws. Uh, they deal with the more unusual or temporary matters. All right, so like the War Powers Resolution, where the president only has a certain amount of time, I think it's now 48 hours, to be able to notify Congress of taking military action somewhere else. All right, that was a huge joint resolution that uh, happened in our history. We also have concurrent resolutions, and they are put together by the House and the Senate that do not force law and don't need the president's signature. Often they are used for foreign affairs, so used for ending congressional meetings too. Uh, some of the concurrent uh, joint resolutions or concurrent resolutions that have happened are uh, like military conflicts in other countries. Uh, one of the more famous ones is when Congress was tired of us being involved in the Syrian war, right? Uh, our government was helping not only give military advice, but also having joint strikes, like joint air strikes and stuff like that. So we wanted to end that, and that's what Congress did. That was a current resolution. All right, and then other resolutions, you have your simple resolution, all right? It's dealt by one house only usually for the adoption of a rule or procedure within that one body that does not need approval, okay? So when Congress, uh, when the House and the Senate make up their own rules, right, these are simple resolutions. Now you also have your emergencies, all right? Congress can act on emergencies uh, where rules are not often followed, okay? Uh, most infamous one was the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, which was passed in response to the economic collapse, right? 2008 was uh, one of the more famous recessions in our history, okay? They also have war. They have war powers, right? So they can uh, basically assist the president on declaring or not declaring war. So those are also examples. <laughs> So this chart here basically shows you every single, uh, basically the statistics from 1947 all the way up until 2014 of about how many bills were introduced, the average numbers of bills introduced per member, uh, the bills that are passed, the ratio of bills passed to bills introduced. Right? So as you can see here, it doesn't often happen. Right, a lot, a lot of these statistics, right? These are like 10%, 5% or less. Right, so it's not often that these bills get actually passed. Uh, recorded votes, you can see all the votes there. Uh, the days, or the time in session and days, and then time in session and hours, and then hours per day in session. All right. The sessions don't often last very long. They're very short sessions, or they can be very long. But typically, as you can see the average here, they only spend a couple days, or a couple hours a day in session. So as you can see, over the 67 years, the total bills introduced were over 350,000 bills introduced. All right. Now, out of all those bills, only about 39% or 39,000 passed. Right. That's an 11% pass rate throughout that history. Right. So we can really see now how uh, bills really don't get passed very often. Right. There's a lot of things that go through that. So as you can see here, a little chart, how a bill becomes a law. Right? So the bill is first introduced into Congress. The bill is referred to a committee. If approved, it goes to the Congress for review. Then it drops down to Congress, where if one House of Congress approves the bill, then it goes to the other House and vice versa. Okay? So bills bounce back and forth between the Senate and the House. Right? If a bill is introduced in the Senate, it'll go to the House. If the bill is introduced to the House, it'll go to the Senate for approval. All right? And then if both houses vote on it, 
then it goes down to the president who decides whether uh, he's going to sign it or they're going to veto it. Right. And then if neither house uh, does not approve the bill, they can either send it back to the committee for uh, edits of it, or they can just reject it in its entirety. Uh, once both the House and the Congress receives the uh, veto bill, right, they have three options. They can either change the bill to better fit the president's liking, right? They can amend it. Uh, they can agree that the bill was never passed and reject it, and it's, or that they can override it, right, with a two-thirds vote. Right. All right. Now that I've done my PowerPoint, you guys. Here's a really, really simple video that explains absolutely everything in three minutes. Alright, so that was much easier. <laughs> you guys have any questions about any of that? Pretty simple stuff, not really. It's very complicated how bills go through the House and the Senate and everything like that. Uh, Basically, all the way down to local policies, it's kind of like the same thing, how it uh, builds and laws happen. So, yeah. so you mentioned the, the writers. Like, shouldn't that be, like, illegal to, like, to, like, attach something that's, like, not even a part of the bill? I mean, I would, I would think it should be illegal, but that's how we get a lot of things passed. Unfortunately, that's one of the ways that it happens. Right, so. And part of part of this whole concept is is people will add writers to a bill that they know the president is going to sign, right? Because it's a big important thing, so they'll add little things to it, so the president will go ahead, all right, fine, sign it, and it goes through anyway, right? So the president doesn't have line item veto. The governor of New Mexico does. She can go in and go, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, and she can cut all that crap out and pass the important stuff. Okay, so the president can't do it, the governors can't. Okay, so. Yeah, they're, they're not a lot of fun, uh, and that's what we're going back to. It's, it's basically bullying a president, right? Like, here, you want this passed, but we're going to throw our own little stuff into it. So, any other questions? Alright, well I want to thank you guys. Uh, thanks for letting me be the weird guy in the back corner just watching you guys. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate your guys' involvement today. So, yeah.